Uh, it's my pleasure at this time to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker, and that's Professor Michael Dittmore. He's chair of the Humanities Teacher Education Division and professor of English Literature. And so, Michael, if you'll come and introduce her. Well, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this evening's lecturer, Dr. Carla F.C. Holloway. And I hope to do that with some brevity. If I don't do that, please push me along because I, I want to neither dishonor Dr. Holloway nor to shortchange her, but I'm genuinely oh. interested in getting on to the issues I know she'll explore in a moment. I've spent most of the last week reading her most recent publication, and so I'm very interested in how she regards the relationship between private bodies, the kind of material things about ourselves we take very much for granted sometimes, um, and often without appreciating how they might be taken otherwise by other people, even ourselves, often without our knowledge or permission or understanding, and what she calls public text, which may take the form of spectacle or uh, exposure, publicity, measurement, exploitation, and entry. And then how the law makes this transformation happen. Um, I found myself page after page provoked and stimulated in countless ways Dr. Holloway, for instance, moves very neatly, masterfully, and powerfully between, on the one hand, very difficult bioethics cases, that of Terry Schiavo, most more recently, or the Tuskegee study of syphilis in the Negro male, or the Rhinelander annulment scandal of the 1920s, among many, many others. And on the other hand, examples of fiction, such as Octavia Butler's Blood Child, oh. Kate Chip Hand's Desiree's Baby, Cashew <coughs> Isuro's Never Let Me Go, and Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. Dr. Holloway explores bioethical predicaments of identity, personhood, privacy, autonomy, and race and gender in ways that are clear and accessible, and yet also deeply engaging and engaged. In particular, she seeks to probe ways that the responsible and searching imagination of fiction can assist us in approaching bioethical dilemmas and problems, those that are known, those that are unknown, those that are foreseen, and those that are not. She tackles with great depth and lucidity profound and enduring issues, but also problems that have persisted far too longer than they ever should have. Let me mention two brief highlights of Dr. Holloway's career. She received her AB in English from Talladega College, then an MA in English from Michigan State University, and later a PhD in English and Linguistics from Michigan State. But additionally, and this is very interesting, she holds a Master of Legal Studies from the Duke University School of Law. She has been a member of the faculty at Duke University since 1994 and currently is the James B. Duke Professor of English and Professor of Law at Duke. Additionally, she holds appointments in two interdisciplinary programs, Women's Studies and African and African American Studies. She also serves on the Greenwall Foundation's Advisory Board in, bio, uh, excuse me, in Bioethics, as well as the Hastings Center, which engages in nonpartisan research in bioethics and public policy. She is co-founder of the John Hope Franklin Center for International and Inter Inter Interdisciplinary Studies and is founding co-director of the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. She has most recently been recipient of the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Residency Fellowship and the Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellowship at Harvard University's Du Bois Institute. In addition to her many published essays, Dr. Holloway has authored eight books, beginning with New Dimensions of Spirituality, a biracial and bicultural reading of the novels of Toni Morrison, as well as Character of the Word, a book about Zora Neale Hurston, both in 1987, and Moorings and Metaphors, Figures of Culture and Gender in Black Women's Literature in 1992. More recently, her scholarship has taken on an increasingly wide and an interdisciplinary net of interest that never lose sight of the concerns and urgencies of these earlier writings. In fact, Holloway's scrutiny has become increasingly focused on analyzing what may seem broadly familiar as well as what is minute and obscure in matters uh, that are difficult to expose and connections that are hard to make. She does so quite nimbly, though. It would be impossible to pin her scholarship down into neat and demarcated, demarcated uh, categories. Neither would we want to. In 1995 came codes of conflict, race, ethics, and the color of our character, and then passed on African-American mourning stories, a brilliant, intriguing, and intertwined of the public and disproportionately of African Americans in the 20th century. This was followed by bookmarks, reading in black and white, but most recently, in 2011, she published Private Bodies, Public Selves, from which she will draw this evening. I've already sp spoken far too long, 
In our dinner this evening, uh, at one point, Dr. Holloway talked about her experience as a college and university administrator and probably why she left that. She said she found herself to be most herself in the classroom, which we all found to be very, very true in the dinner with you this evening. So at this point, would you join with me in welcoming Dr. Holloway to our classroom for the evening? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dittmer. And thank you very much, each of you, for spending this evening with me. This talk is somewhat of a postscript to private bodies and public texts in its critical thinking about the socialities and legal origins of certain kinds of public notice, especially those that are fixed on race and gender. I think it also constructs a bridge to my current project, which I call the last book, um, Legal Fictions. I actually have in it, it will come out at the end of this year, and I have in it the last leaf, because then I just want to stop and write fiction, you know, and just want to make it all up. So Legal Fictions is the end. <laughs> but I appreciate very much the opportunity to share these thoughts, because this is my chance to sort of think about the bridge that you have already so neatly constructed for me and made me feel consistent. So thank you, Professor Dittmer. I also want to thank all of you for this wonderful opportunity to visit this extraordinarily beautiful campus. I haven't been here before. And so the invitation from Dean Dudley and Professor Carr's follow through and others and whoever arranged that room with a view of the Pacific Ocean. What, you know, um, this is actually the week of, as I told people at dinner, my 41st wedding anniversary. And I told my husband, who thinks I'm eager to get home, he's going to have to come here and get me because it's just <laughs> too pretty. Um, but I thought the best way to focus the conversation this evening is to think together about the ways in which identity, especially race and gender difference, become a public narrative. And one interest I have is in how the consequences of our spectacularity, and I mean by that the ways in which we see race and gender, become legally embedded in the ways in which that reflect the constitution of state and national laws. Think immigration debates and voting rights and race. Why things like redistricting might be the first um, task of a newly elected body, issues of gay marriage and affirmative action. So in private bodies, I argue how the visibility of other bodies, um, women and black Americans in particular, result in their exceptionality from the regulatory protocols that naturally incorporate rules of social order particularly a right to privacy. Now, I really just wanted to say that sentence because I have been laboring over it. This is what it means. Um, <laughs> so what it means, you know, sometimes as an English professor, you just get carried away with the words, and you put them together in a certain way, and you want them down there. But then you say, you've got to tell somebody what that sentence means. So what this sentence means is that sometimes blacks and women are hyper-scrutable, particularly publicly notable. So the point that I want you to think about is the way in which some bodies, once situations and narratives become public stories, also become the ways in which we craft legislation um, with the biases and myths of capability or not, inherent characteristics or not, written into our law. Terry Ann Schiavo, whom I will talk about in more detail momentarily, uh, Terry Ann Schiavo's plight actually became the basis for legislation that displaced medical and spousal determinations of capacity. She was a person who um, was dying, what, uh, who's dying, whose death and dying became a public narrative. Um, but the way these things are handled in law and in medicine is there's a contract or doctors make a decision, but suddenly doctors and people making contractual, um, legal decisions were displaced from the picture and the state legislature um, took over. And I want to explain why I think that happens. But it's all about our judgments. Our judgments about welfare queens become the basis of reforms of welfare policies. Our judgment about President Obama's place of birth and whether or not Michelle was motherly or militant worked their ways into our national narratives about that family's acceptability as our nation's first family. I want you to think um, 
probably on your own, and maybe we can talk about it in conversation, about other ways in which the media or politics or national conversations about certain bodies become the ways in which the legislation of those bodies, what we call in my field of cultural studies, disciplining the body, is the consequence. Women, ethnic, and black Americans have been particularly since, um, vulnerable to our laws shifting ethical terrains, the ways in which we've been both citizen subjects and displaced objects of critical studies. We're also the sites of social change and subsequently legal change. And I'll reference here for you quickly the Tuskegee syphilis study. And this is a study that was 40 years long. It was revealed in 1972 as a project of the national, that means federal government, health service that left, and no, no matter what, how many of you have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, right? A lot of people for a long time thought that this meant that um, the government gave people syphilis. Not true, at least in the United States, not true. You ask me about that at q and I'll tell you some new information which has come out. But it did leave syphilis untreated in African-American men so that physician researchers from the government could study its progress. They had a theory that syphilitic heart disease in black people was different from syphilitic heart disease in white people. In other words, black hearts and white hearts weren't biologically the same. And the result of the study's discovery was a report, the Belmont Report, or this, the, the fact that the government was doing this and not treating syphilis, and it could have. Um, the establishment of the Office of Human Research Protections, framework for what we call IRBs, Institutional Review Boards, which are now managed by the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Now this is, a, as Martha Stewart would say, a good thing. A good came out of this. But consider also the consequential focus on black male sexuality, the intimate medical information, the script it sort of creates around black males, their health, their conduct, their bodies. In other words, federal regulation emerged from the spectacle produced when the heinous examples of bias and medical malpractice came under public scrutiny. But black male bodies became the apparatus by which the legal procedures managed change and were stripped of their privacies. So what I'd like to do is sort of frame a conversation with an outline of narrative stories, each of which helps to create, to critically situate the problem of the body that I want to address tonight, the material representation of the body, the ontological status, the quality of being of, of bodies, and eventually, the evolution into the ways in which we consider regulation, bodies of law, systems of beliefs. Um, I don't know how many of you know this story, but it's gotten increasingly popular, the story of Henrietta Lacks. She's actually um, been a case study in science, medicine, law, literature, US studies, a very interdisciplinary subject in the same ways in which cells, and those of you in the sciences, might have worked with tissue cultures which were formed with HeLa cells, HeLa coming from Henrietta Lacks. Um, university after university, college campuses across the United States have made a very popular books about her science and society, the book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Required Reading. It's been widely popularized in book clubs across the United States, made the New York Times bestseller list for consecutive weeks. If we know Henrietta Lacks academically, or if we use her narrative as cultural studies scholars, we get too attuned to what we might call the politics of her life. <coughs> Recently, the American Studies Association president spoke about her in an annual address to the association. The utility of Mrs. Lacks, her cells and her story, as a sort of commercial exchange that informs the politics now of US studies is, I submit, specifically located in her body residing outside of normative protections. She's instrumental. She is an available story as well as an available body. As we rehearse the history, most often with significant errors of fact of what happened to her. What happened was that cells from her tumor were harvested. This happened to every single patient, black or white, that came into Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 1950s. And yes, there were segregated wards then, but they didn't choose Henrietta Lacks because she was a black woman. They chose to take her cells because she had a tumor. And they took cells from her tumor not from her. 
So when people say, you know, is she still alive today in her tissue cultures, I want to say it was the cancer they took the tumor from. You know, this is not her body in the same way. But her story has been instrumentalized. And this is a very famous book now. But it also includes intimate details about her family's lives, details that don't seem necessary at all to reveal if the journalist who wrote it was only concerned about the ethics of what happened to the tumor cells taken from her body, how much money has been made from them, how medical sciences um, made vaccines from polio to other vaccines using HeLa cells as a basis of it. In the past few years, Henrietta Lacks gave many of us in American studies an opportunity to focus on the rich landscapes of our new favorite words, bioslavery, biopolitics, biopower. I've got to admit, I like them too. You know, I like inventing words. But Henrietta Lacks is the available coordinate here. It gave us an opportunity to further distinguish her humanity from the science and sociality of her cell line to the extent that made that very popular book possible. With each telling of the immortal life, the intimacy that is revealed is not so much about the cell line of Mrs. Lax, but her private medical records that report the medical and personal circumstances that contributed to her disease. And more critically, the diminishing capacity of her daughter, who finally trusts a reporter whose own professional interests turned her turn Henrietta Lacks's life and her daughter's into an open narrative for public consumption. Um, this is a slide I found of a group of college students who made one of those giant cutouts, you know, get your picture taken with. And I thought, what a wonderful example to show how commercially appealing she is. And yet, this was a woman who went into a hospital and who died and had no idea of how public her story would be. It was, and it still is, an extraordinary displacement of the private as we consider her unattached value. But it's not remarkable at all when we consider the private as attached to bodies that seem to have less social value than they do biosocial, ways of clarifying our interests and presumptions about natural persons, those to whom the rights of privacy normatively adhere. Now, I don't want to contribute to the proliferation of narratives here that have surrounded Mrs. Lax. Um, I am, have been admittedly in somewhat of a, a Twitter conversation with the author of this book. It's not really a battle, it's a conversation. Um, and uh, you know, she understands, I think, you know, what she tells me is that she got um, legal documents that said she could say whatever, from the family saying she could say what she wanted to. And as a bioethicist, I'm saying, so what is the capacity of the family to agree to do this when what you want is a story of what happened to your mother and if this is what I have to do? So we have some disagreements. Uh, but, so, but I try to make them pretty straightforward and I don't want to use her as I think she has already been used. Uh, what privacies have been lost in the ways in which we actually make a spectacle of the bodies that have been disenfranchised in order for some legal or other process to find its way to them. But the issues that I think will link Mrs. Lax to the other stories I want to share with you is the way in which her body fits those others who become open and available to public scrutiny without normative boundaries of privacy as a part of our text. So in Private Bodies, I invite readers to consider the case of Terry Ann Schievel, who lay dying in a nursing home 15 years after an accident, an automobile accident, um, I'm sorry, not an automobile, an accident in her home left her in what um, physicians call a PVS, persistent vegetative state, legally and medically determined to be no longer alive, kept alive by artificial means. Right to Lifers staged a vigorous battle outside of the nursing home where she lay dying, clamoring that they and the Florida legislature knew better than the person legally invested with the power of a surrogate decision maker, which would be her husband, to make the final decision. The disrespect in that noisy crowd at the moment of her death is haunting. I can never forget these images that I see over and over online and remember hearing actually the press conferences that were held just outside of the room where, I mean, on the outside, you know, this is one of those stretched out nursing homes. And so here's her room, here's the lawn, here's the, um, 
the sidewalk and there are television cameras all around. She's inside dying. Florida's legislature intervened in their husband's determination to end the medical care the doctors had described as futile. Futile is a medical, a medical word that doctors use when they say there is no more reason for treatment. It, there is medical futility. But that was overturned by the state courts, and then Congress decided to override their decision with a legislative act that they named Terry's Law. What could have been a private moment of grief and mourning became a public spectacle. One thing I want you to consider is whether or not a man in this persistent vegetative state would have engendered the same public support. When the names that we know around, those of us who work in the area and, and who read People magazine or watch Lifetime movies, because Lifetime movies have been made about almost all of these women, Terry Ann Scheibel, Nancy Cruzan, Karen Ann Quinlan, maybe you know these names, but there's no movie name um, made about Jonathan or Mark or Christopher, suggest to you whose bodies carry enough public interest for the public to care about how they die. Where are Jonathan's laws or Mark's or Christopher's law? And if you are thinking here this kind of public interest is similar to the story, the interest that follows cases of women and girls gone missing, some who are newsworthy, and others whose names we never hear, we notice there is a division of gender and of race and of ethnicity for those who earn our public regard. As an example that points to the evolu evolution as well as the, you can call it re-narrativization or the storifying of the spectacle, consider how our early regard of HIV AIDS began with an extraordinary fear of this unknown disease its potential, possibilities for contagion, and the ways in which that linked to the stigma that was attached to the persons who had the disease. So it's not just that we were afraid of getting AIDS, we were afraid of people with AIDS. Very different from the fear of polio, becoming a fear of the people who had polio. Over the years now, the narrative has changed from a focus on an already stigmatized sexual minority and to an already stigmatized continent than it was the disease from Africa, or in some narratives in the US, the disease from Haiti. But this happened in part because someone whom we did trust the public story, a princess, Princess Diana, actually touched a man with a disease. You'd have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you'd have to have been there to know what a, that was a Marco Rubio moment, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, yeah, that was perfect. I planned that. Um, anyway, the, it, when Princess Diana touched a man with AIDS, suddenly if she could touch him, if she could be near him, it sort of dissipated some of the stigma around that. Um, and then we started developing stories around AIDS is a disease that everyone has. Um, and if you notice the image that I hope is behind me, right. So I can see the casting call for this. I need a lot of different kind of people. I need old people, young people, black people, brown people, white people, Asian people, you know, young people. And so the idea of trying to change that narrative to that first one about gay men, to one that we all have AIDS. And then finally, thinking about language. When we come to this year's presidential inauguration where the word gay is actually used in an inaugural speech, and last year, or in 2011, the White House acknowledged World AIDS Day and they didn't want us to miss this imagery. Look at that gigantic red ribbon that we have on the White House. So suddenly something that became, was a, not suddenly, but over time, this social stigma of AIDS became something that we could legally um, attach to legislation that we could put into the mouths of the people who represent us in political realms. The federal recognition of this disease actually makes hundreds of thousands of people around the world who get care and um, support from the United States eligible for AIDS treatment as well. In other words, there is a public and arguably legal consequence to visibility. But at what cost? The point of this narrative is that that particular visibility, women, sexual or ethnic minorities, racial minorities, with regard to whatever regulatory rights must adhere for progressive sociality to obtain, 
is also a visibility that makes what might otherwise be a private matter available for public spectacle. That's the argument of private bodies, made in ways that emphasize the medicalization and the distributive justice claims inherent in embodied rights. When I talk about distributive justice and the ethics framework in my classrooms, I always ask, so who should get the last flu shot? The six-year-old child or the 60-something-year-old woman with asthma? Um, and what if we decide the six-year-old child has a really, really high IQ and the 60-something-year-old woman is close to retirement or are thinking about it? You know, so how do we make, what, it, what, what becomes fair in an ethical framework? What kind of stereotypes, what kind of judgments are we making that make us end up with a decision when supplies are low? What remains to consider is not simply our acknowledgement of the persistent histories and exposition. I have to tell you my age. I have to reveal my sex or my gender or more intimate things about me. Um, and I do mean to emphasize the word exposed here. These are the ways in which we track social justice onto identitarian-based knowledges. And they place our own political desires squarely into the mix of institutional, legal and social structures. Here's an example of this. In one chapter of Private Bodies, I, the last chapter, I discuss death and dying with reference especially to Hurricane Katrina. India's differential treatment of victims of the storm. Now, here you can see that the critical word there is looting. Um, a young man, not identified as any other young, except when you look at his picture, He's a young black man, <coughs> um, was looting a grocery store. It's a AFP, um, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and so soda. So, you know, the photos are not much different except the narrative exposition, exposition, the story that we give to them suggests that one is a looter and one is a finder. Where does that come from? The, it's also true, um, you can think about this in another storified way, and this is a, the, the images here are from all different realms. What they try to suggest is that the ways in which we structure our stories end up being the ways in which we legislate around these stories. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to talk about just briefly was gun violence, and I thought that um, I would talk about which deaths are grievable. I've written some on grievable deaths. And I thought I had already sent these slides in, and I, um, last night we saw in the State of the Union, and I did tweet this, um, that the First Lady was making a very direct statement about whose deaths are grievable by having the parents of Hydea Pendleton, the young lady, um, the little girl, the little girl on the right, uh, on the right, um, who died after marching in President Obama's inaug second inauguration um, from a gunshot wound when she went back to Chicago. Um, and sometimes all of these families were at the inauguration. The political moment was all of these deaths are grievable. And we, when we have to select out who we talk about, which it's like selecting Rosa Parks, to ride the bus in Montgomery and be arrested. She wasn't there by accident. Um, Rosa Parks had been working for the NAACP for years prior to her arrest. And there were other families that, and women that the NAACP thought might be the ones who would um, decide to be arrested. She volunteered for duty on that day um, because she was a fine, upstanding Christian woman and she could bear the public scrutiny. The other alternative was a young woman who happened to also be pregnant. Wouldn't bear the public scrutiny as well. We, share, we um, structure these narratives. I'm particularly interested then in the ways in which the media creates the images that we respond to rather than having our independent and substantive information from which to form public opinions. And I'm interested in the way some person's privacies, vulnerable populations that are affected by Hurricane Katrina, or the children and their families in Newtown get swept into the national news without a consistent or respectful regard 
for one of the rights that we argue is fundamental to our integrity, to our constitution as citizens, our incorporations as persons, the right to privacy. I hunted for the image that I would use of Newtown because I didn't want to do what the media did, take pictures outside of funeral homes and pictures of children on school buses. Hydea's picture, mother decided to put her picture in the public domain. So I felt kind of okay using that one. But I do feel, even though the pictures were readily available on Google search, and I really had to look for something that suggested the idea, but that did not, in my mind, invade the privacy. In my judgment, the right to privacy away with such frequency and so easily, whether it's the last iPhone contract you signed, I don't know how many of you read it, it was probably this long and this thin, in law we call them contracts of adhesion, because you don't really read them, you just want the iPhone. You just sign the, sign the contract and toss it away. Who knows what you have signed up for? Um, but we've given away some privacy with that. Facebook accounts, um, Instagram photos, and yes, Twitter, um, I do have some concern about being on Twitter and the privacies that I give away there. I try to keep it professional. Every once in a while something slips in and that's how we lose these rights. But I think we've actually missed the moment for substantive debate around privacy, for some foundational set of privileges or principles to guide us when a tragedy happens in public or when a technology can make us faster and smarter and better and what did I say faster that's what it seems to be about I'm worried about the facile politicization of some of these newsy narratives especially as they become the caricature rather than the substance while she was a patient in Johns Hopkins Hospital Henrietta Lacks became an experimental subject her cellular material was a commercial medium the Tuskegee's Belmont report, it's a regulation of the ways in which we now can do a clinical trial. And it exposes the issue of the Tuskegee study and the men who were in the study. The unruly spectacle at Terry Schiavo's death eventually turned to the courts for resolution. They called it the Easter Sunday Compromise. Um, some versions become legal bodies bound by law that sort of govern their utility. And the eventual legal integrity of these bodies was rendered coherent so the law could find a way to situate them inside of the nation's own evolving fictions of gender and race and identity. We nationalize them body, these bodies, give them some kind of recognition so we know who they are. The effort to regulate through an evolving body of law, whether it's in immigration law or constitutional amendments or federal regulations, it's actually played out on irregular bodies, bodies that provoke legal redress and legal resolution. How does the law act when everyone hasn't always had the legal history of citizenship, when some people have to be incorporated into the law? Or does a democracy actually depend on a script that extends rights to others that once were unrecognizable to the court, people like women or ethnic minorities or immigrants? Is the law actually a shadow of the social body made evident by a previously invisible body? And does this succeed when we can tell a story in a way that makes a body familiar and empathetic? I mean, once we change it, once we put a child in this picture and put a, a sweatshirt on him about his mother, it changes the whole narrative. Um, the American dream, do we make them dreamers? Suddenly the language starts to match the lofty history that the idea of the dream in this country had, whether we're talking about Reverend King's famous speech at the Lincoln Memorial, to the ideals of this country that are so often embodied in that verbiage. Little wonder that dreamers seems to tap into that history rather than the history of painful confrontation and borders. The language choice underscores some understanding of how stories get told and made and believed. I don't think that then political aspirant Barack Obama casually titled his first book, Dreams of My Father. He was tying into that narrative of dreaming and the American dream. And the language and imagery also tie into what we eventually do as a nation to codify our beliefs, to regulate them, to make them into laws. But the version does matter, which is why some bodies are persistently regulated and others aren't. When we look at immigration debates, for example, they are at some level 
some idea about the right that is also fundamental, as much about the right to privacy as it is a right about and a debate about property. America is whose country? When we consider what's private property, we get some sense of the ways in which privacy and property have a fascinating legal history. And I'm gonna to try to pull up this slide. I was gonna to talk to you about castle doctrine. And castle doctrine, I thought I was gonna get pictures on the web of old castles, something like Downton Abbey or you know, wherever, Kensington Palace or something. But castle doctrine is an, comes from English law. It means my home is my castle. Um, and it means that nobody can come into your house without a warrant or your invitation, nobody can breach the personal property of your home. But look at what castle doctrine means today. It's attached to the gun rights movement. And this kind of thinking underscores for me, even subliminally, so your right to property, your home, okay, the argument about a woman's right to her own body, is that her property in the way that our house is a property? And then when the construct of fetal rights comes into the picture, and we can reasonably think about state responsibilities to protect its citizens, so is a fetus a person subject to the protections like the protection of property? Is it a citizen? Where do its rights lie? Does it have rights? I don't wanna ask you to make a judgment here as much as I want you to think about the complexity of the issue as an ethical matter as well as a legal matter. If I can't come into your home without permission, is a home like a body? And why is it that these issues of bodily integrity and property situate women's bodies at the center of our imaginaries when we discuss them? There are a lot of very intimate discussions out there about privacy and gender, much of it about women reproduction, transvaginal ultrasounds, state authorized waiting periods for illegal abortion. You might easily understand the perplexity of Supreme Court justices who complain about Roe v. Wade because literally it discovered a right to privacy in the Constitution that we didn't know was there. Had it been hiding all this time in the Ninth Amendment's due process clause or the 14th Amendment's declaration of liberty and we just didn't see it there? Now, these are reasonable debates. It's sometimes just the folks having them don't behave so reasonably. Um, regardless of your perspective, understand what incredibly intimate sexualized scrutiny comes with this terrain. This woman, Sandra Fluke, um, more famous, perhaps infamous during the last election, appreciates the ways in which a body can be made into a spectacle. It was really interesting that when I started searching for images of Ms. Fluke, who ended up um, testifying before Congress about her position about a Catholic university and what kind of health care should be made available to her, and the big issues was what Rush Limbaugh said about her. But you notice in this um, image that word which rhymes with um, hut, um, is cut off, and it's cut off of a slide, so thank goodness she doesn't have to go around with this image on the web, but there are enough images out there that suggest that even a name that some commentator called her, which was just as my grandmother would say, puro de ugly, um, becomes a part of a public narrative. And so it helps us think about, although there is discernible and arguably reasonable controversy about the distinctions between you know, what we might do with laws regarding um, birth control in this country. How public does a body have to become before we have a policy we agree on? Now, just a quick reminder here. Women were not even envisioned as reasonable persons under the law when the Constitution was framed. We were written into its protections. Blacks, Asians, and others who were not white males were written into law through immigration policies or civil rights legislation. None were imagined or dreamed of as being like an American until some, some body of legislators decided that we could be. And these are the very bodies who undergo spectacular scrutiny, who get narrativized in ways that are not helpful. Asians as model minorities, black children who literally placed their bodies into public lines in order, into public in order to secure rights to education, voting, and integration. How many children do we have to, did we have to lose? The four girls in Birmingham before we decided that the civil rights legislation was a good thing. Gay rights and dreamers fit into an already available narrative of some bodies in America. Once they are visible, 
earning a particular right of reasonable, regular persons. We're more alike than different, according to the Human Genome Project. And it seems that as fundamental as the right to privacy is, as fundamental as our property claims, these notions become a complex scene of negotiation with new laws, new issues, or new bodies come into our America. Philosopher John Locke said that our lives, liberties, and estates are our property because we own our bodies. That's not an artifact of a bygone era. We still have a lot of work to do when working through the difference between property and personhood. If we own our bodies, if we are, if they are our property, what does this mean in terms of the regard of another body? An unborn child, an undocumented worker, gay men, lesbian women. How much privacy will we ask them to surrender before we figure it out? When identity matters, and this is true for gender as well as race, both are suspect classifications according to constitutional law, and socially for sexuality as well as legal personhood, the legal origin is always close to the claim. Now, American jurisprudence has shown itself willing to engage and determine questions of identity and race, and frankly, and here's my return to being a literature professor, so of United States literatures. Think about the titles of some of the classic texts by writers whose identities might fit into the categories. They just weren't writing Invisible Man because I thought that was a good title for a book, or Native Son, or When I Was Puerto Rican, or How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent, um, Native Speaker, or No No Boy. One of the things that happens in American literature is that people end up writing these stories about identity and constitution of identity and privacy because we're still figuring it out as a national narrative. Um, and one of the ways to trace our story of a nation is to look at the stories of our nation, our fictions. Sometimes they are fictions. Other times they're facts. Oftentimes they're a cooperative venture, and that's what I like to think my legal fictions is about. By the way, does anybody recognize what the scene is on the cover of this book? This is not the real cover of the book. This is just my idea about what a good cover would be. They haven't shown me a cover yet, so I'm still imagining ideas. But can anybody recognize it? comes from a famous book. Not Alice in Wonderland. Uncle Tom's Cabin. See Uncle Tom there? And there's little Eva, and I'm thinking that's about a legal story as well as literature and publisher. Wouldn't that be a good idea? They haven't gotten back to me on that yet. Um, but our literatures have consistently reflected and creatively engaged America's shifting social judgments. I write a lot about, if you want to know the story of the law, go read a novel. Because the novels tell us these stories in long, thick. If you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, you are so tired of reading Uncle Tom's Cabin. By the time it's over, you could have written the book. Same with Richard Wright's Native Son, but we learn something about Chicago housing projects that we never would have known before. Same with um, Toni Morrison's Beloved which is a story about an escape from slavery. We learn about American slavery. Now, I think we should go to history for the real story, but the fact that our fictions are representing the stories that engage us as citizens is something I don't want us to not pay attention to. One last story. Early in the 21st century, another version of the dispute regarding a black person's legal claim to personhood emerged. This time, it was the spectacular body of a president whose claim to his office was disputed by some on the spurious basis of his official personhood residing outside of the law that would permit his occupancy, a property claim, of the, law of the, president, of the office of the president. Now, the spoken challenge to Barack Obama's legitimate occupancy of the office rendered this president as illegal, arguably invisible, without standing with regard to the nation's highest elected office. Indeed, some people even focused on the notion of criminal trespass um, and started refocusing on this language of what does it mean to be a natural born citizen? I always want to turn them to Aretha Franklin and say, well, she talked about a natural born woman. What does it feel to be to feel like a natural woman? Ask Aretha. Um, the very language of a natural born citizen has experienced a timely resurrection as if we are not certain yet in the United States what, or better yet, who might be the natural in naturalized. 
Despite a legal document that the president's offer, office proffered as evidence of his rightful claim to a federally viable citizenship, a birth certificate from the state of Hawaii, indicating that he was a natural born citizen of the United States, the sociality of this birtherism claim seemed to have more storied vi viability than the legal document. Forget the, the, the uh, birth certificate. I want to know where he was born. You know, so what we were asking for was a story that would sort of satisfy our imagination here. In my judgment, the place to watch for the evolution of the body is within the law and within our literature. When we notice how we regulate ourselves, we notice the claims of that representation in the histories. And we also notice how we tell stories about it, how some bodies have to be sculpted into being in law and then become recognizable in the socialized imaginaries of our legal fictions. I don't have the slide here of all of the fiction that was written, but you probably know some of the movies. Um, the Man, by an, uh, a novel by, about the first black president, was actually published in the 1950s. Um, but as I think about it, I think there's a Chris Rock movie about a first black president. And some, so we're doing this sort of imagination around this narrative. We're telling the story at the same time we are constructing the story legally. It's a version of noticing what we might dream of and the words that we use to say it. When private bodies become public texts, they are part fiction and part fact. It's left for us to shape the subject. And if we pay close attention, it's not too long at all before we notice we are the subject. We the people. We be the subject. I know that's not grammatical, but that's what I mean. We are the subject of our own imaginations. We tell the stories, but we have to be responsible for the consequences of those stories as well. Thanks very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Why, that's when you want that camera. No, you don't want the camera. <laughs> how, how do the ethical issues related to the right to privacy change when the person has chosen themselves to place themselves into the public spotlight? And do, they, do those rights change? They do change. Actually, they change legally in terms of what we call public persons. And have, if you have decided to be in public, then you are available for public scrutiny. So President Obama, he doesn't get to be a private person. We can use his image. We can talk about him in public without somebody saying that you have invaded my right to privacy. So these people, the, the entertainment industry folks, um, are persons who have given up directly their rights. So a courtroom would say, have you decided to be a public person? What's the evidence of that? So have you put yourself intentionally into a public circumstance, then you don't get to make the same kind of arguments that a regular person would be able to make. So it's really interesting the way this sort of doctrine has emerged because when the public personhood was debated by the courts, there was a case of a man and a woman. Um, a Georgia case, um, Paolo Pasevich was a man who was suing the state because his image had been placed in some public place. And the court supported his right. Uh, states had rights to privacy law before the federal government did, and said, yes, you have an invasion of your privacy. When a woman, um, Abigail Robertson, made a similar claim in the same era, she was determined to be much too pretty to um, complain about being on the box of cereal that she was placed on. And it was a very flattering image, so just go home and, and be happy that you got that image. So there was very gender difference in the way the courts looked at it. But since then, the evolution of privacy laws have depended exactly on that point you make intent. 
you put yourself out there, I can talk about you. That's why Beyonce, you can't take those pictures of you off the web. Um, you all don't know that story, do you? Um, well, but for those of you who do, her publicist doesn't like some of the pictures of her. Well, you know, once they're out there, they're out there. But she doesn't have a right to have those pictures removed in the way that um, some of us might have the right to say, I don't want pictures of me out in public. That's a good question. Thank you. Oh. At the party, the year before, Clive Davis's. Yeah, yeah. I only know these people because um, I read all the same. <laughs> yeah, it's part of my job as a cultural studies scholar to be informed about these issues. Um, you know, I actually did not think too much about um, that particular portion of it. Uh, you know, was it good judgment? Who knows? Mm -hmm. it, but she was not a private person, so you know that right that you might say, well, once you die, you have some right to respect. Well, I was thinking about her funeral and how some people were actually taking pictures of her in the casket, even though and the and there had been, you know, I think there was some investigation who took the picture, but it was, you know, with the cell phones and stuff, it's easy to do that. So there were arguably some invasions. But Whitney Houston was a public person. And so to claim that she had privacy at a certain moment is erased once you enter. You can't be selectively public and selectively private. She just didn't have it. Was it in poor taste? Probably. Um, that never stopped anybody. Not even back in the day. Other questions? Yes. I just wanted to ask a little more about what you mentioned earlier with the syphilis disease. You said ask me during the question. And yeah. Um, interestingly, the researcher who's done the most in that, Susan Reverby at Wellesley College, found in the last couple of years that at the same time that the U.S. government was carrying out experiments, um, experiments in um, Alabama around syphilis with black men, it was injecting syphilis I mean, it was injecting gonorrhea into patients in Guatemala, um, people who were poor, who were working in sex trade industries, um, men and women both. That has, although I've talked to Susan about this, and she said, no, it doesn't change the story of the history of the United States. They were not injecting um, syphilis, and there's been no evidence of that. But there are actually transcripts of the doctor saying, we would never get away with this in the United States. So they, we exported the trials. Um, we exported birth control trials to Puerto Rico in order to, um, to engage in them without federal oversight during the 1950s. So the fact that, oh, and what's happened with Guatemala is that um, Secretary Clinton orchestrated an apology from President Obama to the um, country of Guatemala, which, you know, the whole politics around apology is extraordinary, but when a government apologizes, it's sort of like, and then what are you going to do for me? So it's not just a, oh, I'm so sorry, but it's a moment for perhaps reparation. So we don't know what was attached to that apology. That's why people are so hesitant to apologize officially for things now, because it can mean, and you owe me. Too. But um, the government, President um, Obama did apologize to the people of Guatemala for the Guatemalan um, um, STD studies. So the fact that we were injecting there has made some people in the United States more querulous of the material back at Tuskegee. Um, I'm sort of, I'm still with the investigations that say no, but just barely so because I have no evidence to say otherwise. It just push me a little bit. <laughs> yes? I was uh, thinking a little bit while you are speaking about uh, disability and how in, in the case of people with developmental disabilities where they're um, in need of an arbiter, in need of someone to support their case, and then thinking about how in the 1960s and 70s they were uh, frequently put into institutions, and then based upon um, Policy towards those institutions changed. 
Yeah. That's such a wonderful example because it shows exactly working the opposite way from what you'd expect. We had the stigma of mental illness, um, the stigma of disability sort of being turned around by, I don't know which show has a child with Down syndrome on it or a young man, I think it was. But then that gives us the opportunity to change the narrative and say, oh, everything's okay, they can be on t TV, they don't need the federal funds. So that's why it's always a push and pull between what does it mean, what do you give up, what do you sacrifice in order to be public so that privately you can get some sort of um, a different kind of treatment. But that's the story turned the other way. Being public might also make the publics normalize you. And that's what happens, has happened with Down syndrome, for which there is a whole spectrum of disorder. So the child in television is much more able than some of his, um, some people who have Down syndrome who are much more disabled by the disease, but we'd much rather think the story sounds much more Pollyanna-ish if it's not, that, it's not that bad at all. My interest is in just doing exactly what you did. Think about not you know, the destination of the idea or the policy, but how we got there. And if we got there by a route that's questionable, let's, let's do some backstepping and see if we can fix some of those judgments that were made in order to make a decision. Just been placed on a, um, the first time in my life, <laughs> it's gonna likely be my last, on a commission by the Institute of Medicine on Death and Dying. It meets next week in Washington. And I think I'm the humanist on the committee because there are a whole lot of physicians and public policy and people who work with numbers on the committee. And I sort of wanna listen to how death and dying is talked about, what kind of language we're using, um, what kind of language surrounds palliative care. One of the things I was telling one of my colleagues on the way in is that when I first started talking about death and dying in African American communities, people said, well, you know, at the end of life, when you're 85, a lot of black folks don't get to be 85 years. So we need to sort of narrativize those in ways that match what happens to certain populations in this country and then think about what kind of care decisions um, pretty much Still the case is if you tell an African-American family, it's time to withdraw medical treatment. <laughs> withdraw, <laughs> excuse me, you know, give me, some, give me the next doctor. Give me the doctor in charge of you as the doctor because we've had a history of being of under treatment. So when a physician comes up and says, the compassionate thing to do is to stop, you're pulling this into a history of, I've heard this story before and it didn't turn out too well for me. Um, so we have to think about what the histories of our words have meant. I often think that um, A and D, a natural death, is much better language to use rather than phys physician-assisted death or however we're talking about it. But if we talk about natural, let a person die naturally rather than taking away the tubes and whatever. We might at least make one of those leaps. But it's a really good analogy you made to disability. We have to be careful how we get to our ideas. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Holloway, um, one of the first things I got when I woke up this morning was the push notice from CNN mm -hmm. that the, the incinerated remains of Chris Storm's body have been found. So this evokes me lots of questions about criminalizing, mm -hmm. right? So as I think about what you and the linkages to public policy, how, how would you explain or talk aloud about mass incarceration as a well, well, well. policy, right, that is, that is um, creating a narrative that says a lot about us as society? I'm just curious yeah. how you riff on that, because I, I think it's a, a, a fascinating script publicly that's playing out in very tangible forms of, of policy. Let me, let me get to it a little bit roundabout because I was looking at how successfully families who were the victim of the shooter, not in Aurora, but the guy with the red beard, um, the next, not, not the movie theater shooting, the, forget, it was a mass shooting just before Newtown. Does anybody remember? 
which one I'm talking about? Pardon me? Maybe it, was, maybe it was the Aurora shooter then and not the Sikh temple. So the family said, we don't want to see pictures online of the um, person who killed. We want to see the pictures of our loved ones. This was even true in Newtown, too. So suddenly there was a displacement of, um, instead of the images that we have seen recently of James, I think his name is James Dorner, um, um, those families were able to get that picture off and put my loved ones on. CNN especially was attentive to this. Now nobody, I, I assume nobody asked that in this situation because over and over in the last few days I've just seen this man's image on. So I've been thinking about it in that way in which um, that imagery was not controlled by a public narrative we want to talk about our loss, but a, a private narrative we want to talk about or focus on our loss, but a public one about um, the person who shot policemen and terrorized their families. So that was one differential I saw there. Um, I think a lot of the skepticism that I have read about online is attached to the um, history of the LAPD and the public mistrust of that body of law enforcement. And that shows us that we have not dealt with that history if it's available to use once again and something that, and I'm just speaking as a you know, regular newspaper reader here, something that seems so um, apparent as this is the man who did the shootings in the last two weeks. So that could be a story, a distinct story all by itself. But instead, it's tied into stories about incarceration. It's tied into whatever manifesto he wrote. It's tied into LAPD history. And it's tied into that because the publicly available narrative is the narrative of incarceration that we're familiar with. It's the one that, oh, I get that. you know. And his race is not as much an issue here as is that system. So I think that the pitifulness in this story is how easily the news media can be moved from one frame of it to the next frame without any coherence around what is it as a public we should be thinking about this. Um, and I don't know that we should be thinking about this as a public. Um, I don't know that this is about the issue around gun violence. I don't know that this, I don't know how else it's been attacked. I don't know if this is about the LAPD or not. Um, but I know the reason that it is so um, easy to pierce through that story with things that we are familiar with um, is because we haven't solved those issues yet. So he was able easily to tap into that vein. I'm talking about the LAPD. Oh, we have that story. So instead of interrogating that story or wondering what that story really is in 2013, rather than back in whatever, you know, 20 years ago, um, we seem like we don't have to fill in the gaps there. I think there are a lot of gaps in this story. Um, that's the way I think I'd, I'd like to think about it, but I could talk to you a bit more about it. Bill Cosby did Bill a study. Cosby, mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a study, and primarily the answer that came back was everything's all right with black folks. And so I'm wondering if there's a connection between all of that public policy that takes place related to, um, you know, mm -hmm. the money's coming from the federal government being cut off, et cetera, related to. That's a, that's a really interesting thought. I haven't thought directly about that. I do know. Um, or I have thought directly about how much better for America it was to have a narrative about black families, how much better America thought it was to have a narrative about a black family like the Cosby rather than ones from the Moynihan Report. And so poverty sort of falls to the radar because the Cosbys were ridiculously, you know, the thing that bothered me about the Cosby show was everything was always about money on that show, you know, how much this cost, and it kind of just, you know, you're not supposed to talk about money in public, so it sort of bothered me that they violated that grandmotherly norm my grandmother had, but the idea was it made us less likely to talk about poverty 
in America. I don't know if there's a direct correlation, but I know that we were so, we, and I mean NAACP, black folk in general, black folk in particular, were so eager to have something say, we're not that bad. We're not Fred Sanford or whatever else, with Jimmy J.J. Walker or whatever other nonsense was on television. We're like the Cosbys. To displace one narrative for the other, that the harm that other narrative might have been, might have been the invisibility of those who needed our public policy attention. I think that's a very, very thoughtful perspective. I'd like to see some um, research that suggests that it is exactly that. I forget what his dissertation was about. Um, he was an interesting man. Cosby wasn't happy with the results where they just said, oh, everything's good. Mm -hmm. Cosby was upset about that. Yeah, um, there has been a lot of talk these days about, although there was, uh, I was on something we call Duke Chat last night, which is, if there's a political speech on, get on Twitter and tweet along with it. So I was tweeting my own thoughts about the speech. Um, I didn't tweet, although others were talking about, is he going to say the word poverty? Is he going to say the word poor? He did. Not in a context that I thought was, he meaning the president, that I thought was very um, deeply engaged. But at least he said the P word. And that's what people were looking for. Is he going to say the poverty word? As if that's going to move us to another place in which this will become part of a common discourse. See where we take our direction from? Whether or not he says the AIDS word, the gay word, the um, World AIDS Day is at the White House, is acknowledged by the White House or not. So that's where the narratives come from. Let's thank uh, Professor Holloway. We're thank you, Dean.